Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea the trees of the forest will sing for joy. It is our responsibility and great job to take care for our world. Please be seated. If you would please join me in the prayer of confession found in your bulletin. Lord, we pray for this world you made. We ask your blessing on earth, wind, and water. Preserve this sweet place in its course through the cosmos. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for the community of living creatures. Guide us in our works and ways that every being may praise with its life and serve all of its days. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, we pray for our human family. You named us stewards of this earth, and we want to tend it and care for it. Teach us how to live in harmony together so we can live in harmony with the earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, again and again, we seek what is good and we do what is bad. We stand in the rubble of many bad choices. We have been forgetful and willful tenants since you first put us in the garden. Give us strength and courage to change our ways so this earth may flourish under, your, under our care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, 
At the end of all things, you will bring us into your household to make community with you forever. Fill us with your spirit now in our days on this earth so we may be fit and ready for the new heaven and the new earth you promise. Lord, in our prayer, prayer prayers. Lord, you've called us to be stewards of this wonderful earth. Guide our efforts, refresh the ground and the sea, let the air be soft and sweet. Teach us to care for your earth as you care for us. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. We will now sing the duck So the green team asked the Sunday school kids if they would make posters um, about Earth Day. And the children chose their own topic. We talked about it a little bit. And then they chose their own topic to draw. Um, and they're going to tell you a little bit about it if they would like to share. I think they might show up on, well, we'll see if they show up on the screen. There we go. Good job. OK. So Aubrey, what would you like to tell us about your poster? So I drew a tree because plants and trees produce oxygen for us to breathe. And a solar panel that creates electricity from the sun without burning poles or stuff like that and polluting the air from all the smoke and ash. And I also drew a windmill because they help produce electricity and water without doing stuff like that, too. Thank you, Aubrey. <laughs> Eliza, what would you like to tell us? I drew the earth because I walk around and I have a pool and I see, like, a lot, a lot, a lot of trash. 
even though we're just kids, everybody can litter. And I found a whole entire soil bed. And I was like, why do people do that? Why do they? And we also do trash walks to help the earth along two roads. And we once did, got three bags full of trash. And we have like a smash the cart catchphrase. Who does? not good for anything. That is all I have to say about my church. I hope I can help anything. Thank you. Thank you, Eliza. Margaret? Um, I made my poster about the oceans and fish because if you litter, the fish will eat it and they will die and they will have no food. Thank you, Everett. And Julia, what would you like to tell us? This one um, is, has no trash. That's why the fishies and sharks are happy. <laughs> and in this, this one, um, there's um, all trash, so the fishies and sharks aren't happy. And in the big one, um, there's um, none trash. And that's why the fishies are happy. And in the tiny one, there's only a little bit of trash. Thank you, Julia. Thank you all very much. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Psalms, Psalm 24, 1 through 6. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. For he has founded it on the seas and established it on the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift up their souls to what is false and do not swear deceitfully. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from the God of their salvation. Such is the company of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. The next reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter six, verses 24 through 33. No one can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, Will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Our final scripture for this morning is from the book of Job, chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. But ask the animals, and they will teach you, the birds of the air, and they will tell you. 
Ask the plants of the earth, and they will teach you, and the fish of the sea will declare to you. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of every human being. I'd like to welcome Reverend Marianne Cotter to our pulpit this morning. Good morning. Thank you so much to the Green Team for inviting me to come and share with you this morning on this Sunday when we honor Earth Day. Thank you also for providing this excellent um, handout from the Interfaith Power and Light. I noticed that they're on the back table or on the table in the, in the do you call it the narthex? In the narthex. Um, and <clears throat> this handout confirms what we know to be true in our gut, which is that we are living in a time of a changing climate. And that's really what I'd like to talk to you about this morning. And I'd like to talk to you about how the climate story measures up what happens to the climate story as we also realize we are also living in the Jesus story. So I'm gonna invite you to join with me for the next few minutes to put these two stories together, the Jesus story, and the story about living in a changing climate. I believe that Jesus gave us the solution to the climate crisis. And it's found in Matthew chapter 6. No, Jesus of Nazareth didn't know anything about rising greenhouse gas emissions, but he did know our souls. And he knew that if we put wealth before God, that things aren't going to go well. You can't worship God and money both. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. I believe that the climate crisis that we're living through has its roots in our love of wealth more than God. We're seeing the results of what happens when we strive for our own economic gain rather than living out Matthew 6.33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was speaking primarily to a poor audience. <clears throat> Jesus' followers, for the most part, were landless Judeans. They had few material assets. They lived day by day under Roman domination, and they had to pay very high taxes to the Romans. And as faithful Jews, they were asked to go to Jerusalem several times a year and to buy animals at the Temple Mount to be offered as sacrifices so that they could gain, regain God's favor. And that was expensive, and often they didn't have money to do that. So these were the people that Jesus was speaking to when he said, do not worry about your life and what you're going to eat and drink. And what you're going to wear, trust that God is going to provide these things for you. Seek God's kingdom first. Jesus knew that we could get obsessed, caught up with thinking about food. What am I going to eat? When am I going to eat it? Th thinking about things, houses, clothing, things to make life easier. He knew that getting just a little bit of these things, what we actually need, can often fuel a desire for more. Don't get caught up in that cycle, Jesus said. Keep your focus on God. And he urged them to a radical, he invited them into a radical trust in God. That was his message to the poor. But we also know that Jesus also had rich people among his followers, people who, who were with him and, and wanted to know more about him. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell the story of a rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And when Jesus tells him that he has to sell all he has, give to the poor, and then come and follow Jesus, the man went away feeling sad. So when Jesus said, you cannot serve God and wealth, he was speaking both to rich and poor. So what is Jesus saying to us in these words today? 
To answer that question, I'd like to tell you a story. In the United Methodist Church, pastors are appointed by the bishop. And in 2000, I was appointed to serve as lead pastor of a church in Brookfield, a pretty well-off suburb in Milwaukee. Brookfield is right next to Elm Grove, which has even wealthier and bigger houses with big lawns and often a Lexus or a Mercedes parked out front. Now, before coming to Brookfield, I had served in a town of 1,200 in Shawano County, a pretty rural area where you had to drive 15 minutes to get to a decent-sized grocery store, and you had to drive about 45 minutes uh, to get to a big box store. It was really pretty rural. But now I lived in Brookfield, and I could drive five minutes, and there was every kind of fast food restaurant that you could ever think of, and every kind of retail store that you could ever think of just within a few minutes of my house. Now, this was back in 2000, remember. So the other thing is that when I went to the YMCA to work out, I was like, I was just overwhelmed because you could watch TV while you were on the treadmill. And this was just felt so opulent. So that first summer when I began making pastoral visits, I went to some pretty fancy houses. And I would have to brace myself before I went into people's homes. I am not going to be overwhelmed by the size of this house. I am not going to be overwhelmed by the size of this in-ground swimming pool. But to be honest, I was overwhelmed. What I quickly learned getting to know my new congregation was that even though some of my flock had most anything money can buy, with a million choices of restaurants, places to travel, technological toys at their disposal, that didn't mean that these people were necessarily happy or fulfilled. I remember one family in particular, two doctors in the family, and it was they who owned that big in-ground swimming pool. And the doctor, the, the man in the family, um, I didn't meet him for, for the first three months I was there uh, because in the summer he never goes to church. He's on the golf course every Sunday morning. But he was a very faithful Sunday school teacher. He su taught Sunday school nine months of the year. His wife was very active in missions and in a small group. And they supported the church financially very generously. The man in the family, I learned later, also suffered from severe depression. These were my people, my flock. These, this couple, they were people of faith. But like all of us, they struggled to balance their love of God and their love of money. So fast forward to 2014, when I came to, I was appointed to serve here in Baraboo. And I moved into the church-owned home on 14th Avenue, which has four bedrooms. It is a lovely home. It's very grateful for the church to provide that for, our, for my spouse and I. Uh, this home was built in the 1960s uh, for a family. Uh, the pastor at the time of the church had, had a large family. And um, when I first saw the parsonage, though, uh, my first thought was, there's many ethnic groups in this world who would have three families living in the floor space that two of us were living in. Beautiful, as I said, four bedrooms and, and a finished basement. And it really wasn't that big a house compared to many homes in, in Baraboo. I tell you these stories because my reaction to my wealthy parishioners in Brookfield and Elm Grove is similar to what many people from India or Africa would probably have if they visited the parsonage that I lived in here in Baraboo until I retired. Maybe that house isn't that different from yours. You and I, uh, we don't have to walk uh, to get water, to bathe, or cook like many people around the world have to do. Um, we don't have to light a fire uh, to cook our food. We have four walls to protect us when we sleep. And we have space to grow a garden of our own, most of us. How wealthy we are. 
Even just being able to shop at places like Walmart with its abundance of consumer goods is a luxury most people on earth would only, can only dream of. There would need to be 19 Earths to provide the raw materials for everyone on the planet to enjoy the kind of material wealth we in North America have. 19 Earths. I believe if Jesus came into our midst today, he would look around and he would say, hmm, this is a bunch of pretty wealthy people. It's not a sin to be rich and it's not a sin to be poor. But being relatively wealthy compared to the rest of the world does play a role in where we are right now in, with the climate. There is a connection between our standard of living in this country and the current climate crisis. The United States, we in the United States, we make up 4% of the world's population. But the United States is responsible for 25% of the historic emissions that drive climate change. We're 4% of the world's population and the United States is responsible for one quarter of the historic emissions that drive climate change. Now the connection between wealth and the climate was driven home to me uh, last year when I read this book. It's called The Climate Book. It's uh, edited by uh, a woman named Greta Thunberg Greta Thunberg is, um, she began her career as a climate activist as a teenager and um, very appropriate for the youth that you had participating in the service today. She was in high school and she learned about the climate crisis and she didn't like the fact that the Swedish government wasn't doing very much about it in her view and so she, uh, she, had a, she called a strike and she would not go to school uh, Fridays and she would sit outside the parliament and protest and since then she's become a leader um, in the United Nations uh, speaking to global leaders and um, and challenging them so early in this book uh, this book the climate book I read a statistic that really made me stop and think and I'm going to share it with you she, early in this book she says that the top 1% of the world's population in terms of wealth is responsible for twice as much carbon pollution as the people who make up the poorest half of humanity. I'm just gonna read that again. The top 1% of the world's population in terms of wealth is responsible for twice as much carbon pollution as the people who make up the poorest half of humanity. Those people who have to walk to get water or who have to cook their food over fire. So who makes up that 1%? Well, if you have assets of over $1,055,337, you are in the top 1%. So the top 1% of people in this world have assets of $1,055,337. And so again, remember, this is the value of, of your house, your investments, your retirement, your vehicles, any money you've inherited, any, your agricultural land if you're a farmer, your pension if you have one. If that's over, a little bit over a million dollars, you are pretty much in that 1% that top 1%. Now, and you know, if you think about it, there are condos that are on the market here in Baraboo for $434,000. So if you are an owner of one of those condos, um, then you are almost halfway there to being in that uh, 1%. Now, when I say that Jesus would see us as rich people if he were here today. I'm not focusing on us as individuals because obviously I don't know what's in your bank account. But I'm talking about us as North Americans and that we are very wealthy compared to the rest of the world. And so we who are rich in the global context. So what 
So what does Jesus say to us about this climate crisis and what does it mean to be faithful in this, in this reality? If you want to be spiritually healthy and love God more than wealth, we need to go back to Matthew 6, 31 and 33. Therefore, do not worry about what you will eat or what you will drink or what you will wear, but seek first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So to explain what it means to strive first for the kingdom of God in a climate-changing world, I'd like to bring in another one of my climate heroes. His name is Bill McKibben. Bill McKibben was a journalist, and then when he started writing about the environment and the climate, he became a full-time activist. He, was, he is the founder of 350.org and also Third Act, which is an organizing tool for people like me, baby boomers, to get them active in the climate change movement. And Bill McKibben is also a person of faith. A reporter once asked Bill McKibben, he said, what is the single most important thing individuals can do for the climate? And his response was to stop thinking and acting like an individual. To stop thinking and acting like an individual, thinking only about ourselves, and think instead about the impact of our actions, our consumption, our national policy on climate impacts, around how it affects people around the world. I believe that is what Jesus would say, is striving for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Because when we do these things, we are taking on the mind of Christ as Paul described in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own, own interests, but to the interests of others, unquote. The people suffering most from climate impacts right now are people other than us, people who are poor and vulnerable, people in marginalized communities. So, I'm going to end with the good news. Then and now, Jesus knew and knows our hearts. He knows we can be materially wealthy and spiritually poor. He knows that in our quest for more, 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 we can be left feeling empty. He knew that God alone could satisfy our desires. And as we respond to the climate crisis and relinquish parts of our way of life that harm the earth and our global neighbors. As we learn to use less energy, consume less, travel differently, eat differently, as we do these things, we are following even more closely the one who came not to be served, but to serve, and who gave his life as a ransom for many. Seek first God not wealth. The most important thing we can do for the climate is to stop thinking and acting like an individual and strive first for the kingdom of God. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please take a moment for silent prayer. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please find the insert in your bulletin uh, for the words and music to The Climate is Changing. I think you'll find the music familiar. It's immortal. It's, it's another hymn that you'll find the music familiar to. And please stand and join us. Creator God, thank you for the many gifts you have given us. So much beauty and abundance in our creation all around us. May we pray and work to care for your wonderful creation. Now go and serve the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen and we'll be seated and listen to the postlude. 